<laughs> what up everybody, it's Robin Trey here. Today we're gonna be going over preventing diseases and pests in your garden. My bad. You know, already on that good ganja green that we all love to bring into our garden if you're so able to. Um, and then uh, there's this whole thing where it's like, oh, this is great, until you run into an issue with some kind of pest, some kind of disease, and um, a lot of people, some people will freak out about the littlest thing, and other people won't notice it until it's more than you wanted in the first place. Yeah, you ruined it. Uh, so I would say prevention, 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 prevention. Practice is a huge thing that is hard to maintain. Um, for any grower, any person, I think routine and discipline is hard in any form of life. Yeah. Um, but it's really necessary in your garden in order to even try uh, to have a, a safe space where your, your plants can worry about nothing other than eating and growing. Yeah, and I think that's where a lot of people who have a, you know a full-time job, got the nine to five, or you have a family or other responsibilities. Both. <laughs> yeah, it, oh, for all, you know, it's hard to really get that schedule in to be in your room and do the due diligence to cleaning everything. When you have a little spill, dust in the corner, you know, just small things like that, that really can turn into some serious issues. I mean, pests thrive in dirty areas. And that's where my first tip would be, you know, having cleanliness in your room. If you don't have your room tight, you don't have things that are basically buttoned up, bugs are gonna thrive and disease could too. If you have, you're spilling water all the time and you're gonna have high humidity because of that, you could be risking getting bud rot in your room powdery mildew i mean there's a lot of different issues when it comes to the humidity issues so i think that people who are Bad sloppy thing. and they go in their room and they're kind of lackluster with the the performance and the cleanliness well yeah they risk more issues with the you, bugs if you're more of a person who's like <laughs> or will walk over a mess versus cleaning a mess that mess is eventually going to be a pain in your ass and, yeah um so you know shot backs are super handy and helpful um, if you're, you know, in plant trays or tents or wherever you are to just suck up that water, add in moisture, pH and time is all it takes for any kind of bacteria to form. Yeah. That's in life, not just in gardens. Absolutely. And that's, you know, and my second point is like having an optimized environment and that goes right hand in hand is cleanliness and having everything taken care of properly. If you're, you know, like in my old grow, it was an open grow space with just black, white poly on the walls, but there was kind of like lackluster airflow. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have anything buttoned up tight. I'd say in the winter, it was good. Summertime, I'd be dealing with high humidity and high temperature because I didn't have a lot of in and outtake air. Like it was super minimal wasn't controlled it wasn't controlled like it could be and that's where when you don't have the proper conditions like that you could be risking again powdery mildew in your room if that humidity is too high and you don't have proper air intake and outtake there's not a good airflow in there you do risk things like that bugs thrive in those kind of environments when they don't have good airflow in the room you know uh, a trick like i mentioned in the uh, mite video lowering the humidity in the room will definitely help with that if you can't control it and the room's not optimized you can't lower it so it's kind of goes hand in hand with prevention and with you know maintaining a proper garden it's optimizing your room so that way it's not just a room yeah optimize and sanitize sanitize and optimize yeah and you know if let's say you're in a scenario where you don't have bugs yet or you do you know we're talking specifically past something like thrips mites um and they suck root aphids, aphids. Root aphids. Fungus gnats. One thing I would recommend is... Russet mites. Ugh, the list goes on and it just makes me squirm when we talk about it. Gross! It's like when you see a flea in a room, you just Caterpillars, the the grasshoppers if you're outdoors. Yeah, nature is a bitch sometimes. Yeah. But, you know, that being said, <laughs> predator pests. There's things like ladybugs is what I use often. Sometimes I notice the ones that are purchased from the store are like like mentally handicapped i swear to god like they just don't move they don't do what they're inbred. supposed to do they're like all inbred they're like domesticated i feel like they're just not hungry and they still work but you're gonna have a lot of them in your room and you're gonna need to be cleaning those up over time because they do end up dying off i use, use sugar water i don't yeah. know if you did but i usually use sugar water in my room 
and that kind of helps feed them. They're able to drink that. And But they almost go for that more than your plants. Sometimes. Yeah, I know this. So I usually will put a small little cup, like real small cup inside of the base of my plant if I'm dealing with root aphids or something like that to keep them in there basically as a preventative measure. Yep. So the things like um, praying mantises, there's predator mites. Um, yep. There's a few other things too. Drop them in the comments, I'm a little bit stoned right now, but there's a few other things that you can use uh, like nematodes, things like that. Oh yeah. You know, for, for basically to use those as prevention. So if you do have any bugs that come in, they're gonna eat them. They're basically gonna be the predator in the environment. So you may not wanna have that if you're in an open space, but if you have a grow tent or if you're growing outside in an enclosed area, that's definitely a nice option. Yeah. But you also have to keep the environment optimum for them too, to to, yeah, to, you don't to do what all. they need to do. You know, just like we're saying with some of the ladybugs, I can imagine I've never had to use predatory mites or anything like that. But I would say that you have to keep them in a good way too. You yeah. Know, to, for them to work for you. Exactly. Because aside from that, you're probably going to have to go to something like a insecticide or fungicide. Some, you know. A fungicide if you're dealing with, um, you know, any kind of disease. Um, or some kind of rinsing agent if you're dealing with like a root rot, um, something like a, even like an H2O2 or a, uh, used to be a SM90 and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. <laughs> like a clear res or any kind of flushing, SLF100 like is a good one. using like a diluted bleach water, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of different things you can do when it comes to stuff like that, but with fungicide and Pesticide in general, of course you want to use it as sparingly as possible, but organic options are definitely the best in my opinion. There's things like rosemary. Uh, different kinds of like soybean oils yeah. and canola oils. And uh, like neem oil is one that's been used for years, but there's kind of debate on whether or not that should, when and where that should be used. Yeah, definitely not in flour. I've been <coughs> things linked to this like chronic cannabis disorder, some sort of shit where people are like throwing up from using it so so i mean definitely it, sparingly and make sure that you read labels there's a lot of products that they're like mixed with different natural oils in there like smite or green cleaner things like that that work really well that are more organic that you can use in veg and in flour but i mean once you're budding yeah, don't flour ahead. yeah I'm, I, I, I would just say like green cleaner is one that i can safely say currently that i've recommended to a number of customers and friends it's not organic but the ingredients in it are derived from pretty natural things versus anything with a pyrethium in it or pyrethians or whatever the breakdown of those are. I, I, I don't get scientific, y'all know this. But, um, you know, I have a lot of people come in and go, oh, I'm gonna use Azimax, you know, and that's good because it's I'm relisted. Well, you haven't been able to purchase that in a number of legal states for years now based on regulations. And yes, it's I'm relisted, but that just, I mean, labeling is a motherfucker, so we'll just say that, but it just means it's derived from organic things. There's also things in Azimax that have been linked to cancer. So it's just, you gotta be careful about what you're bearing on your plants. So that's why we're recommending organic things so that we can grab the blunt and <laughs> truthfully tell you guys that you're safe to use these on your plants. Um, I would say like diatinaceous earth is one that is good for any kind of crawling um, pests. Things in your medium especially. Yep, and like uh, tea drops or formerly known as tanlin is really good for uh, fungus gnats. Um, I haven't heard anything bad reported about it. <laughs> uh, also, I know Rob's used Mighty for years, and yeah, it's kind of on the borderline. It's really good preventative. I yeah, would that's say. really what I. It's, it doesn't, in my opinion. Thanks, Rocco. He has to make an appearance. In my opinion, it doesn't really like. They claim it kills the babies. It kills the you know the mites. I I don't know. It doesn't seem to totally do the trick. That along with something like green cleaner that usually does it for me. Again, I've used a neem oil mix like I mentioned in my course and I mentioned in the mite video, but that again, sparingly and not when you're in flower. So once you do get in flower, predator mites, um, predator pests in general, those would be your best option. But if you dial in your environment, you're doing everything right initially, it, usually you can avoid it. Now, sometimes it does happen and to the extreme really depends on if you should like nuke it, if you should start over or if you should just keep carrying on and try to just fight them so to speak 
yeah, them or you know, disease. Disease yeah, is really or them. <laughs> like root rot, you can come back from that. Depend, and it also depends on how much you've been optimizing your garden and maintaining your garden to be optimized. Because if you have powdery mildew, you have root rot, and it goes on un uh, resolved, you're gonna have a bad case of it. Yeah, and so to that severity you're not gonna have much of an option other than to cut your losses, if that. So, there's that. Bugs, they can be tricky, and a lot of times you have to hit them with a couple different things. It's not just gonna be one thing solves all, and if it is, it's gonna be something you probably shouldn't be using. Yeah, that's, you know, that's my biggest thing too, is if you're wanting to just kill everything off and you're early in veg, you you can usually get away with that, but I've you seen can get away with a couple of really things. foul. Yeah, I've seen some really foul shit out there that people should really stay away from. You know, when you're dealing with like powdery mildew, there's been people who use Eagle Twenty and really bad stuff that they shouldn't be putting on their blood for themselves, let alone patients or other people out there like that. And in my opinion, if it's something that's getting to your bud and it's that far in, either a pull it early and and take the loss. It is what it is. Take it on the chin, or you know, try to fight it and get your environment right. Get more airflow in the room. If you have something like a sulfur burner and veg, you can use that to potentially fight it. But I'm a little skeptical on using those in general. Um, I mean, if you have like good airflow and you're running CO2, I know people who run sulfur burners and they don't have too many issues. Yeah. But you have to know what you're doing. Exactly, that, that's for another video. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but in general, it's like, it, you gotta know when to hold them, when to fold them. If you got something like, you know, spider mites and you're seeing some damage on the leaves, you know, maybe if you have other plants in your room, you might want to consider pulling that early, doing a quick flush and pulling it early. But you can really just fight that with uh, pulling off the majorly damaged leaves and trying to have good airflow in your room, even dropping that humidity down lower, like I mentioned again in the mite video. But at the same time, if you're dealing with webs and things are getting, you know, Chris Webby out there, you may just want to cut it. But this is just like what we've done in our personal guidance because you try to salvage whatever it is that you have. Yeah, especially when you got a lot of time and energy invested into it. Like there's been times before where I've had, you know, the single plants underneath a single light and I've had six months of vegging where it's it was stupid in my opinion, but tons of time and there was a little bit of mite damage and I've literally cut a whole plant down because I, I was, you know, I was ignorant. I was afraid I had people tell me like, oh, there's mites. Destroy it! Well, it wasn't even that bad. There was a tiny bit of fucking damage and I could have controlled it when it was in veg. But that's where you gotta know what you're looking at. You gotta be paying attention to that. You got things like thrips that are a little bit harder to see with the naked eye sometimes until you get close and like, oh, I have a little bitch ass worm in my plant. Well, it's little stuff yeah. that if you're not in your room and you're not paying attention to things, you're gonna miss it. And then it could get so bad that you may just need to nuke it. You may need to cut the whole room and, and be done. But you gotta, again, you gotta be able to identify that plant stress properly and know when it's too far gone or when it's salvageable. Just that there's gardeners out there um, and probably even caretakers that, you know, you have pockets in your garden where you're dealing with PM or you're dealing with, um, you know, mites or thrips. Thrips are pretty manageable, you know, fortunately and unfortunately. I've dealt with quite a bit of them. He's dealt with, I think, all of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was fucking a parents grow. But there's no way for you to learn how to deal with it until you deal with it. So that being said, there's again gardeners who've had that in their room, and they're able to maintain that away or quarantine it away or whatever have you to where, you know, they're able to push through. But you just have to use your better judgment. And, you know, you're, again, if it's a small personal grow, try to salvage what you can. If it's, you know, larger than that, obviously you're going to have to use some of the 20 things here that we've recommended yeah. um, in our own personal experiences to your issue and, you know, hope that it works. Yeah. And if, if you need more help with stuff like that, you're struggling to know what to put on your plants or you know to put things on or not you know check out the 420 growers club we discussed that quite a bit we're going to be doing another live stream here real soon mm -hmm. so if you got some questions there drop it in the comment section or in the 420 growers club and uh always stay lifted